Um, welcome to Introduction to Monitoring Land Birds. This is kind of like an intro presentation to the Land Bird Monitoring Program and workshop that we'll be holding in the Dominican Republic, as I mentioned before. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Birds Caribbean. We're a regional nonprofit dedicated to um, conserving birds and nature throughout all the islands. We're really focused on capacity building and working with our partners throughout all the islands to um, work together for Caribbean birds in a sustainable future. So that's just a very quick introduction. And I will say um, welcome to Holly and take it away. All right, thanks, Lisa. Um, so hello, I'm Holly. I'm, um, I'm gonna be one of the trainers and facilitators for the uh, Land Bird Monitoring Workshop in Dominican Republic. I'm coming to you today from Costa Rica. Um, and so I'm hoping my internet connection stays stable, but we have Jeff and Lisa just in case I do end up dropping out. But really excited to talk to you guys today about introduction to monitoring land birds. So um, first, let's start out with a pretty basic question. So what is bird monitoring? And so what sort of differentiates bird monitoring from, say, bird watching? So bird monitoring is actually counting birds on a regular basis um, in a certain defined area. So taking an area and really, really doing a thorough sampling. And so regular also can be anywhere from monthly, it can be seasonal, it can be during migration, it can be during a breeding season. But what's important is that it's, it's a defined set, it's a defined time period um, where you are making sure that these counts happen periodically. So it's a, it's a good way of, of standardizing. Um, when the monitoring has happened. And so the certain defined area can be anything from a specific site to a region, to a type of habitat, to a country. So you can start off small, you can expand it to bigger. It, again, a lot of it also, a lot of monitoring can be modified depending on what your um, time availability is, what your monetary situation is. So a lot of it, it's just, a, it's a idea is to do it on a regular basis. And so, and the data that we collect during bird monitoring provides really vital information on bird numbers. So we're getting an idea of abundance. So how many birds there are, we're getting an idea of the distribution. So where are these birds occurring? Um, are there birds that are occurring in areas where we wouldn't expect them? Um, and then we're also getting an idea of diversity. So what is the avian community like? Are, do we have a lot of species in a certain area? Do we not have as many species, but a lot of individuals? So we're kind of getting with monitoring, we're getting a really great idea of abundance distribution and diversity. And once you have this good baseline data and you know kind of how these avian populations are, what they're like, then monitoring actually allows you to monitor changes in abundance, distribution and diversity. So we can use monitoring as an amazing baseline. And then from there we can, we can kind of have an idea of what the population base is. And then when traumatic things occur, such as a hurricane, or a storm, um, then we'll actually know how the bird populations respond because we already kind of know what the baseline is. So monitoring is, it's kind of like the very first step and it's very essential, so. Um, and so why, why do we monitor birds? Why is monitoring important? So monitoring helps us, um, it provides information on status and trends of bird populations globally, nationally, or regionally. So it's a really good way to get a sense of what bird populations are doing on a large scale, but also locally. There's sometimes bird populations might not be doing good in one region, but they might actually globally not be considered threatened. And so it's really important to actually keep in mind where we're looking at these populations. Um, and with monitoring, we can study seasonal or annual fluctuations of bird populations. So we can see how these populations change. Um, and especially seasonally, we can see sort of how the birds are doing depending season to season. And then annually, we can look at are the population is the bird population changing year by year, and then this is so this is especially important to identify changes when when changes can occur at a site or a region. So again, any sort of human disturbance, any sort of habitat disturbance, having this monitoring data um, allows us to see how the birds are responding to these disturbance, and it can give us information on the status of a site, so um, how the site's doing, um, what the bird population is like at this site. So we can get a lot of really important information from monitoring and really start to understand bird populations kind of on a regional and global level. Um, so why, why monitor birds in particular? So birds are really good indicator species. And so a bioindicator 
is defined as any biological species or group of species whose function, population, or status um, provides key information on the state of the environment. So in the case of birds, birds tend to be very sensitive. So a lot of times when we see any sort of global change or any sort of environmental change, birds tend to be some of the first to respond. They respond very strongly to habitat disturbance. They respond to environmental changes. So if anyone's ever heard of the phrase canary in the coal mine, it's because birds tend to be more sensitive and will, birds will respond before that kind of danger hits us. Um, and so when we actually see how bird populations are responding, we can get a sense of what's to come and we can get a sense of how, how it's also, how environmental changes are also gonna affect us. So birds tend to be, and, and birds are also fairly easy to monitor in comparison to some other animals. So not only are they great indicators, but we're able to monitor them fairly easily. And so why, why else are birds good indicators? So they have a really high position in the food pyramid. And so a lot of times they're eating insects, which are eating plants or eating smaller insects. So you have their several levels up in the food chain. And because of that, they tend to any sort of effects that might be or any sort of um, anything that might be affecting insect populations on a smaller level gets amplified the higher up you go on the food chain. So as it gets amplified, birds, um, we tend to see these effects greater in birds. Um, birds also receive great attention from a large audience. Um, I know all of us are here because we love birds and we love watching them. So birds are very charismatic. They're fun to watch. People everywhere tend to have either some sort of story about birds, even, and you can usually get some sort of small appreciation from birds. So just the amount of attention birds get, it makes them really great focal point to just focus on, on, on protecting them and how when we protect birds, we protect so much more for ourselves. Um, with birds, many species are easily detected and it might not seem that way sometimes when you know, you're trying to, to watch a small warbler flitting around in the trees, but especially compared to some other fauna, such as mammals, birds are fairly easy to detect. They have really awesome identifiable songs. They have pretty distinct plumages. So once we kind of get a hang of that, um, we have a, we're, we're fairly easily able to detect birds. Um, and they also occupy a wide variety of habitat types. So you can find birds on every continent, um, including Antarctica, of course. And so we can see birds everywhere, which also makes them great. So not only can we detect them, but we know that pretty much everywhere birds are gonna be present. Um, and they, as I mentioned, they respond to changes both positive and negative. So when we see bird populations growing, when we see bird populations responding to reforestation efforts, we know that we're doing something right. And when we see bird populations declining because of possibly habitat urbanization or, or urbanization or habitat destruction, then we know that maybe we're doing something wrong. So again, birds are, are usually one of the first um, organisms we see to respond. And so when we keep an eye on them and when we monitor them, it really helps us give us baseline data. So not only for the birds, but for the habitats and the areas in general. So sometimes these changes in populations that we see in birds can be related to environmental change. Um, so a really great example is the hurricanes a lot of times that we see in the Bahamas. Um, so these changes in fluctuation in climate, so periodic storms, um, climate change, at least increasing hurricanes with increasing intensity, um, forest fires, um, volcanic eruptions, such as the La, La Soufriere volcano in St. Vincent, um, and the after effects of Bahamas, like, or the after effects of hurricanes, such as Hurricane Dorian in the Grand Bahama. So we, when we have baseline data for these bird populations, we can really see how these, these environmental um, disasters really affect the bird populations. Um, and so the La Soufriere volcano was a very recent eruption from um, this past year or last year in 2021. And we're still doing some monitoring on the ground to see exactly how the birds were affected, what's been going on. Um, and similar in Hurricane Dorian, there is some on the ground work to really understand how, what's happening with the birds. How do the birds respond? Because as these environmental, as climate change makes these storms stronger and, and as we start to see greater devastation to the habitat, then the birds similarly are going to be affected.
But so there's not only environmental effects or the birds are not only facing that, but there's also some direct threats to bird populations themselves. Um, hunting and poaching is a big problem. Um, a lot of um, example that's not with land birds per se, but a lot of the shorebird hunting in the Lesser Antilles of the, especially the yellow legs has become a huge problem. And so many of, so many, the birds are, the hunting isn't sustainable anymore. So we're losing so many, um, so many birds because of it. And um, another big one is the capture of wild birds for pet trade. So we've been covering this a lot um, in Birds Caribbean recently with the, the capture of birds in Cuba. And we're actually seeing it where birds like the Cuban grass quit, um, we're no longer really seeing them. Uh, we're not seeing the populations as much. We're not, the birds aren't as common. Um, they're much harder to see now because so many birds have been poached for the pet trade. And it, you can really start to see birds that are migratory, such as the painted bunting and some of, or indigo bunting, some of these just like really sp bright, special birds. Um, when they're being caught in the pet trade, they're no longer migrating and we're, we're missing them and we're, we're not seeing them as much. So, so just something where keeping birds in cages like that, it's really, we're seeing an effect on the, on the population scale. Um, there's also direct threats like invasive species like mongoose, rats, cats. Um, they're a huge problem. I know during my master's thesis, um, most of the toady nests that I was monitoring got predated by rats and mongoose. So they weren't even being predated by native predators. They're being predated by invasive mammals. And so many birds don't have um, adapted responses. So because of that, these invasive mammals are just, they take such a, a greater toll on the nesting success of so many birds. You also have threats like disturbance, so losing habitat. Not all birds are able to cope as well as some, such as house sparrows, and increasing development. So with all of this, it's really important that bird monitoring is more important than ever. Um, so through monitoring, these changes can be documented and then correlated with environmental changes or threats. And so based on this, we can actually use monitoring data to make direct management decisions. Um, so for instance, on the basis of some results, we can do, we can reduce or eliminate use of pesticides and fertilizers. One of the best examples of this that's been used as a lot is the DDT and the peregrine falcon. So showing the declines in raptor populations in the 80s was correlated with the use of DDT. And once the use of DDT was banned, there was a direct increase in raptor populations again. And uh, so just showing how these birds are responding to environmental or to even things we do by reducing and eliminating that and making those direct management decisions, then we can actually see the bird populations increase. Um, another one is limiting or eliminating livestock grazing, um, which again has a lot of habitat destruction that goes along with it. Um, controlling invasive species, there's been so many studies that have shown by removing um, rats and mongoose from islands that especially seabird nest success increase and so many birds are just able to nest again and they're not facing this invasive predator that they don't know how to respond to. Um, protecting and restoring the habitat so when we're doing reforestation efforts, seeing how the birds respond can give us a really good idea about how successful or what else we need to do, what else other species do the bird, what other tree species or um, plant species do the birds need? Um, changing hunting regulations, so making hunting sustainable, uh, having limits on the amount of birds taken um, can all allow hunting to persist while also making sure these populations persist. Um, employ wardens for patrol of legal capture birds, impose fines, community education. So there's a lot of monitoring with birds that actually has very direct um, wildlife management implications. Um, so there's some more reasons for the importance of monitoring. So there's some really awesome success stories that come from monitoring. One from the Caribbean is the Ridgeway's hawk. And so the Ridgeway's hawk is an endangered species of hawk endemic to Hispaniola. And 
the population was so reduced that there was really only, it was really only found in some areas of Bhutakana, Saitisais, and the Peregrine Fund did some amazing work. And so they, they identified what were the causes of decline. One of the big causes was a nest parasite called a botfly. And they're a larval parasite. Um, so uh, mosquitoes will lay the eggs and then a larva will develop under the skin and emerge. But sometimes these birds get so overladen with parasites that the nestlings can't survive. So the Peregrine Fund started doing some amazing work, removing botflies from chicks. They started treating some of the nests with um, diatomaceous earth, which was helping also reduce chances of infection. And then one of the other really big problems was a lot of people were killing these hawks. So not only were these hawks being devastated by parasites, but then they were also facing a lot of, um, a lot of killing from the local community, a lot of hunting. And one of the reasons were this, these hawks, um, they're birds of prey, and so they often go after chickens. And so the Peregrine Fund did some really amazing work teaching the community about how to manage their chickens so the hawks would no longer predate them. And so they, they helped the community build enclosures for their chickens. And by doing that, the community no longer saw the hawk as a threat. And they actually started to see some of the benefits the hawk brings, such as pest control, um, eating more of the, these invasive rats. And, and so actually, it was a really, it's a, it's a really awesome story of how monitoring this hawk, seeing the population decline, responding to it, and then engaging the local community. Actually, as the population has now rebounded and there's a, there's a pretty stable population in Punta Cana. There's a stable population in Los Atices National Park. And I believe there's even some sightings in Haiti now. And I know Peregrine Fund's doing some more work um, to possibly reintroduce them into the Cordillera Central of Dominican Republic. So the project has been so successful that now we're seeing hawk populations rebounding, which is amazing for a hawk that's super endemic and really only found in the Dominican Republic. So it really just shows by looking at these species and looking at these case studies, we can see what works, what doesn't work, and what can we do to keep these birds um, alive and with us. So another, so here, a really great example of monitoring and the good that can come from it. Um, so adaptive management is learning by doing. And so it's a critical tool for these management decisions that we're making when we're monitoring bird populations. So the first step comes with assessing. So we want to assess the conservation status. We want to decide on priorities. We want to see how the birds are doing, if there's any species of concern, and we, we really want to go from there. And so once we've kind of made that initial assessment, we want to design a management and conservation plan with an aim to, to increase these bird populations um, or with, with an aim, um, some sort of goal. And then from there, once we've designed a management and conservation plan, we want to implement it. So we want to actually um, take action and make this plan happen. And then once we've implemented our plan, so we've implemented some monitoring strategy, then we're going to monitor. And we want to see how effective was this management decision? What else can we do? How has it been doing? And then Monitoring these results will help us inform future decisions and um, policies. So with monitoring, we can evaluate what did we do well, what went wrong, what can we improve upon, what should we continue doing because the bird population responded to it or the community responded to it. And then from there, we adjust our management plan and then we assess again, how is the population doing, what else needs to be done. And so it's a really nice cyclical way of managing um, of, of monitoring birds and, and managing these monitoring plans. And so there's some, there's some great examples of bird monitoring programs. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, they run a breeding waterfowl habitat survey and they use this data directly to decide what the the quotas are going to be for the hunting season. So they're deciding the limits based on how the waterfowl are doing during the breeding season. So that's a very direct way to see, okay, so how are the birds doing via monitoring? And then people who want to hunt them, how can we make sure that they're hunting responsibly and we're keeping the population at a status quo? Another really great one that a lot of people participate in, including many of us in the Caribbean, um, is the Audubon Christmas bird count. And that one has a cool backstory since it started 
as originally people going out to hunt, but then it kind of turned into this really awesome count to just see how the birds are doing. And we can get great baseline data every winter. Um, it's like, so again, it's an example of an annual count that that's done every winter. And we can see how the bird populations are doing. The North American Breeding Bird Survey is another long-term monitoring program. Project Feeder Watch is a really neat one um that help that kind of brings monitoring to people's backyards and people are able to report the birds that come to their feeders uh the international water bird census and our own caribbean water bird census that re just recently we um today was the final day for 2022 um and we've had 12 years of success with the water caribbean water bird census which has been really awesome to see um and really awesome to to monitor the water birds the Great Backyard Bird Count, again, is another way to kind of bring monitoring to home and actually um, have monitoring in your own backyard. The Global Big Day um, has been a really successful monitoring. We've actually seen every year the amount of participation, the amount of people contributing data points has increased. Um, and so it's a great way, again, it's just like a once a year, we can see during migration how the birds are doing. And by getting everybody out, it's a, it's a really awesome way to do um, a fun monitoring. We also have the global shorebird count. Um, so again, so some really awesome monitoring programs that currently have years of success and hopefully many more to come. Um, so now we'll discuss some general considerations in designing your monitoring program and kind of what maybe what you need and, um, and some things to think about as we're monitoring birds. So counting land birds is easy, right? So definitely uh, drop a comment into our chat. Let us know if you agree. Do you think it's easy counting land birds? Maybe you have a couple of stories of, uh, of, of the times when you, we went out to try to count land birds. Um, so, so yeah, if you wanna, if you wanna drop you, if, if you agree or not in the chat, we'd love to see it. Don't be shy. Who agrees with the statement? <laughs> not at all. Good. <laughs> From Giselle. Aaliyah, nope. <laughs> Anybody else? Do you agree? Disagree? <laughs> I think so. That's great. We want to hear from you. Big depend yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a bit hard in a dense forest. Yep. Yes. Not all the time. Yep. Harder than wetlands for sure. for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Not when counting Caribbean martins on the roost. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes land birds cooperate. <laughs> yeah. Sparrows There's so many of them, though. Oh, leaf birds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> leaf birds, yeah. There's a lot of, yeah, tree birds and stump birds, too. Yep, high up in the can canopy when you get the warbler neck, right? Oh. Oh, oh yeah, the those birds up in the canopy. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for all the comments. All right, let's yeah. see. Um, let's talk about it a little bit more. Go ahead, Holly. Yeah, so um, so here's some of the habitats where you may be counting land birds. So you have the Grenada Dry Forest, um, a great example. You can see how dense the vegetation is. So you're probably going to be needing your machete and you can expect that thorns might create some new, some new little holes in your clothes. Um, definitely does not look like an easy habitat to survey. And if you have ever surveyed it, please feel free to agree or disagree um, in the comments. But um, so you have definitely some harder habitats to survey. Um, here we have above it is uh, where we'll be hosting the land bird monitoring workshop, Hadabakoa. And it's a beautiful area, Hadabakoa, but there are so many hills when you're out surveying land birds and you just, you're walking hills. And sometimes you're out in the hot sun in these kind of open areas counting palm chats. And then other times you're bushwhacking through these riparian corridors um, and hoping there is a cattle trail you can follow. Um, and then you have the St. Vincent Rainforest, which again, a dense tropical forest. Um, maybe you have a trail, 
maybe you don't. Sometimes when you're doing a, a transect, you have to go where the land takes you um, or where the transect takes you. So you might be in for um, for fun surprise and bushwhacking. So so land monitoring land birds isn't easy. And, and often we, um, we end up in these very difficult habitats. And so we kind of have to face uh, the, the what, what these habitats entail. Um, and so uh, it, other times we have large flocks of birds. We have huge flocks of Hispaniola and parakeets that might fly over. And so maybe we'll go up to a tower like this and look for birds. But then sometimes if we're up in a cloud forest, this entire tower might be engulfed in a cloud and then we might not be able to see many birds at all, um, which is when we might rely more on listening to birds. So yeah, just some of the challenges that come with monitoring land birds. Um, and we'll, we'll get a bit more into that now. So what are some of the challenges of counting land birds? So what do you guys think? What are some of the challenges that you guys have found. Um, again, I, I would love to hear uh, kind of what you think. Um, so drop some comments in the chat. Um, what are some of the challenges you you imagine go with counting land birds? And if you haven't done much monitoring of land birds yet, that's okay. Think about just even birding. You know what makes yeah. birding hard because you know, monitoring birds is the same as birding, but you're just counting um, with a protocol. So it's it's kind of similar to birding. It's just more complicated. So yeah, non-ideal weather. Yes, rain can yep. be kind of miserable. Hearing but not seeing them. Yep. Yeah, yeah, get really good with bird calls. Oh yeah, mixed flocks of moving warblers. Those will challenge you. Density of vegetation. That's a good one. Ooh, yeah. Warblers. Warblers. Yes. Especially <laughs> in confusing fall plumages. Oh, yeah. Young birds moving fast. Yes. They're just flitting around, right? Yeah, they never stay still. Yeah. Not looking in the right places. Yeah. Habitat complexity, blood sucking <laughs> insect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's really something in those tropical forests that'll get you. Oh yeah, another for migratory warblers, yeah. Good ones, guys. Keep Good them coming. Ones. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for, for- I think, I think you've mentioned a lot of these already. Yeah, yeah, so they move around a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only hearing yeah. chips and calls, but you can't really see the bird to confirm the ID. Yep. Yeah, variety of songs and calls. So sometimes even within one species, you're not only learning a song, but you're learning the call, you're learning maybe another call, you're learning a flight call. Um, then there might also be variation. Banana quits might sound different on his call than they do in Grenada. So you get a lot, especially the vocalizations are tricky. Um, yeah, fast flying parrots. So challenges of learning to identify birds as they're moving. Um, yep, challenging to identify. You have birds that change plumages like these warblers. A lot of a lot of votes for warblers being some of the challenging mm -hmm. land birds to count, and I would agree. <laughs> um, and so in a census or sample, so often we when we're when we're monitoring land birds, we're we're not going to be able to count every single bird present. So some might not be visible and others might not be vocalizing depending on the time of year. And so instead what we do when we're doing, when we're monitoring is we count samples. And then with these samples, we try to come up um, with an estimate of the true population. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So what are some of the ways that we can sample land birds? So one of the big ones, a lot of times that we use are point counts. So usually it'll involve finding a habitat, choosing a standardized set of points that could be maybe a square four by four, three by three, and then sampling at each point for a set amount of time, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, um, and getting a sense of all of the birds. Usually you'll record if you recorded the birds visually, if you recorded them by their song or call. So a standardized way to monitor birds. Another is transect, so kind of choosing to walk a transect, and either monitoring birds throughout it or maybe stopping at certain points to, to conduct a, um, a point count. Uh, we have area searches as well. So um, a little bit more general, getting a general sense 
of what birds are in an area, but usually walking a certain area, walking a certain route um, and recording all of the birds that you find. Um, and then banding is another really great way to sample land birds. We're not really gonna cover that one so much in this talk, just because banding out of is its own very specified protocol. And uh, we will be doing a different workshop on that in the Bahamas in March. But um, for now, we're gonna really focus on point counts, transects, um, and area searches. Okay, we'll take a minute. Um, Sumaya raised her hand. Jeff, can you um, unmute her and let her ask him or her ask the question? Uh, I can try if I can figure out how you unmute somebody. Let's see. You should be able to see the participants list. I'm looking at the participants. I'm not seeing Sumaya. Oh, I got a message saying she raised her hand. There it is. Right. Go ahead. So Maya, what was your question? Okay, so Maya is definitely unmuted and we're not hearing, we're not hearing you yet. Um, your other option is you can also type your question in the chat. Jeff is monitoring the chat and he'll do his best to answer the question. And we'll be doing Q and A at the end of the um, webinar. So you could also hold your question. Sumaya, do you want to ask your question now or you want to wait? We're not hearing you yet. Okay, well, we'll keep going. Um, feel free to write okay. your question in the chat. Let's keep going. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, with a sample, um, so ideally we can, we can begin to kind of derive a population estimate by knowing two things about birds. Um, so one, we want to count of the individuals, and then we want what are the chances of actually counting that individual, which comes down to detection probability. So for instance, taking um, a bird that uh, a common endemic in the Dominican Republic, if we have a count of palm chats, we have a count of 12. So we want to know, so are those 12 palm chats 90% of the population in Hadabakoa, uh, or would that be 50% of the population in Hadabakoa? And so that percentage is the detectability of those palm chats. So um, understanding, because kind of, we're not going to see every bird, unfortunately, when we sample, um, or probably not. And so we want to get an idea of what percentage we're seeing, and then that, that, is, that percentage is the detectability. So there's a couple aspects of detection probability. Um, availability probability of the bird for detection. So that means that the probability that the palm chat is present and in a place where it could be detected. So the chance that the palm chat is out on a purge and that you can see it, it's not hidden. So the probability that it's around and it's detectable. So the second aspect is detected if available. So this is the probability that the bird was actually detected and counted by the observer if it was available for the detection during the count. So the difference essentially is, is the bird present and is the bird detectable and was the bird actually detected by the observer? Um, so this is a really great example using eBird data in Kentucky Warbler. Um, and so you can kind of see the average count um, from January for the course of a year. And so you can see that, and this is um, in an area where these birds occur year round. Um, so you can see that the average count um, kind of drops during the winter months and then peaks again during May. And so if we think about a lot of times the natural history of the bird, what's happening in May and June is breeding. So the birds are singing, they're becoming more detectable. And then as during the breeding season, that kind of that detectability drops off as they're nesting um, and they're probably not advertising as much, maybe becoming a little bit more secretive, but then post breeding season, their detection increases again. So maybe they're calling, maybe they're more active. They're not kind of hunkered down on a nest um, or defending a territory. So you can really see how even the bird's behavior can alter the detection probability. Um, and so here, um, this is the total number of Kentucky warblers that was detected um, in the same um, same area. And so you can you can really see here how much the detection spike 
during the breeding season. So again, we have this breeding season peak where when the birds are singing, um, they're much more easily detectable. So there's a huge spike here. And then again, it just kind of drops off. So it's not to say that they're not around, but they become much more detectable during the spring um, when, they're, when they're breeding. So this is a really good representation of how detectability changes throughout the year. So now we're gonna go through some quick statistical terms. Um, I promise we won't get too technical on you. Um, so uh, we have error. So this is the difference between the estimate and the absolute. So what we estimate the population to be versus what we think the absolute population is. Um, so variation. So this is how different our counts are from each other. Um, so if I maybe detect only two birds, but someone else detects three, that's some variation. Um, so bias, how are our estimates consistently offset from the absolute? So um, what are some issues or errors that might be occurring? Accuracy, so this is a measure of how near the estimated or sample mean is to the true mean. So um, how close are we to actually getting that, that sample of the birds? Um, and then precision, so this is a measure of the normal variation um, within the count. And so we'll kind of we'll kind of go through some some visual examples of these, so um, you can get an idea of. So here's an example. So are these points precise? No. And so with precision, we want to know kind of like are things is it consistently. Um, or is it are we consistently getting the same error or the same answer? So if I go do a census and Lisa does a census and Jeff does a census, are we all coming up with the same, the same count? And so if this was our count, the answer would be no. So we're not very precise. So we're not all kind of arriving at the same sample. Um, versus when we look at this, we all went out, we did a count, and we all arrived at more or less the same number, so our answer is precise. But we want to know if this is accurate. We need to actually have an idea of what the um, what the mean would be, or what the what we would. Yeah. So here is our here is our goal of what we're striving for. Um, and so, yeah, you can think of that dot as like the true population size, right? That's. Mm -hmm. So in the previous slide, you could see the variation around that. So, and now we have our true population size, yes. So in this count, we have an example that this is accurate. So when we would average out all of these counts, we would get a number that's fairly close to the, the mean or the true population size. The numbers are round. Um, and so another example, so here now let's factor in precision. So when we go out to do our counts, we're all coming up with different numbers. And at the end, if we average them, it will result in an average that is the true mean. So it will be accurate, but it's not very precise. So you can see that the averages are kind of very spread out. And while you do arrive at the same conclusion, it's not very, very precise. Um, and so here's an example where now we can see that we are accurate. So we're all going to arrive at that, that true population mean when we average everything and we're precise. We can see that all of the, the counts are kind of clustered together. So we can see that not only were we accurate, but we were all precise. We all were coming up with more or less the same numbers when we went out. So now we can see that when we average this count out, it's not accurate. So we're not going to arrive at that true population mean that's in the center, but we are precise. So we are consistently coming up with the same numbers. And what might be the reason for this is there might be some form of bias. Um, so uh, with accuracy, precision in birds. So if we go out and we, these are the counts that we um, 
we go out and maybe we do this on a weekly basis. So one week we get 20 Palm Chats, another week we get 22 Palm Chats, another week we get 21 Palm Chats, another week 20, 23, 21. So are these precise and are they accurate? So we have they're more or less precise, but then in order to know if they're accurate, we need to have an estimate of the true, of the true population. Um, and so in a sample, an estimate, is, an estimate is made up of two key things. So you have a count of the individual. So how many individuals did we count? And then we have what are the chances of counting an individual? So we have detectability. And so we need to think about what factors can impact our, both of our counts and our detectabilities, because these factors will have an impact on the estimates of population trends or the population size derived from those counts. Because we're never going to count every single bird within a population, it's really essential that we, we count when, when we're getting these counts, we think about what, are, what is the detectability and we think about forms of bias as well. So how can we improve our, our estimates to make sure that we are arriving at a true population estimate, a true mean? So we can reduce or quantify the bias in the data that we collect. Um, we can reduce variation in the data we collect and we can increase detectability of the individual or species. And so what, so now we're gonna open this up to you guys again. Um, so what are some sources of bias and variation that you can think of? So what are some things that might affect a count that you do? What might be some reasons that you're not getting a total count of the population? Um, what might increase the detectability of the birds that you're trying to monitor? What do you guys think? Um, drop some comments. It, it looks like we do have a couple questions too. Hmm. Observer bias is a big one. Yeah, bird calls. If you're not yeah, able yeah. to accurately identify a bird, either by sight or sound, that could be a source of bias, especially for certain species, right? Like maybe you know all your warblers really well, but you don't know, you know, another group of birds. So you might be, um, your kinds might be fine for some one group, but not another. Observer skill, definitely. Time of day. Yeah, definitely. definitely. That's minutes. a huge one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely and there's even some birds like during migration, you might detect night flight calls might be totally mm -hmm. different than birds you would detect migrating during the day because they might not. Right. So that's right. a huge one. Yeah. Yeah, think about doing a count at six or seven a.m. versus at noon, you know, it's definitely gonna yeah. vary a lot. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we're silent reclusive birds, you might not detect those. So yeah, we have time and day, bird behavior, survey location, weather conditions, if it's raining, you might not detect birds either. Um, Maybe your binoculars are broken, so you're not seeing the birds as well. That's going to be a source of bias or variation. Maybe you're doing a count with people that are being noisy and talking a lot. That's going to scare the birds off and obviously bias your data or cause errors. Yeah, misidentification. Yeah, there's, there's definitely yep, some words that sound very, very similar yep. to them. Yeah, double, that's a really good one is not wanting to overestimate too, is, is maybe you're underestimating um, because you don't want to double count birds. Yeah. Season, yeah. Yep. How tired are you? Yeah, how dark or light it is. Did you party last night? And so therefore you're not <laughs> um, in good shape to see and hear birds, you're sleepy. So Jeff, do you wanna comment on, I think you're answering um, Daniela's question. Um, sure. Yeah, so so a lot of the monitoring or, or, or um, monitoring protocols are designed to answer kind of multiple questions, not only to get a count of birds, but also to begin to get a reasonable estimate of detectability for those birds um, with variation in time of day or season or distance from the observer or the observers themselves. Um, and when you, when you start to get a measure of detectability and raw counts, then using um, statistical methods, which <clears throat> I'm far from an expert in, 
can begin to get an estimate of, of a population or changes in a population over time, as well as kind of a, a measure of how confident we are in that estimate, which is um, traditionally called just a confidence interval. Um, so it's a combination of all these things that are, that are pulled together um, and modeled to, to come up with that population estimate. And, you know, you're ne we're never 100% sure that the number we come up with for a population is the exact number. But um, generally with the statistical methods and the modeling methods, we can come up with a range of say, the pop we're 95% sure that the population is between 300 and 500 birds, for example, right? Exactly. And that begins to give us something that we can then look at over time. And maybe we come back the next year after a hurricane and we see, we go through the same monitoring effort and that estimate comes up with somewhere between 100 and 250 birds. And we know that that population dropped. We don't know what the exact population necessarily was, <clears throat> but we know that the bird's in trouble. Uh, and it's just, just an example of, of, of kind of how these monitoring efforts work out through time and, and um, what we can learn from them. Right, so yeah, one of the key things when you're monitoring from year to year is to use the same protocol because then you're minimizing other sources of bias and variation and you're getting like an index to the population size. You may not know the true size, but if you do your methods the same every time, then you're gonna have an index to the population size where you feel confident that if you count more or less birds, that that's a true increase or decrease. And that's what the modeling can help you figure out and the statistics. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yes, yeah, so how do we reduce the impacts from bias and variation? Because there's so many sources of bias and variation that we really can't account for them all. And so a lot of times we have to use our knowledge of the site. So, um, it, so it helps to monitor birds in an area you're familiar with and knowledge of the birds. So knowing when maybe an unfamiliar bird um, occurs and um, knowledge of the birds, their behavior, when do they breed, when are you more likely to detect them and then and knowledge of the surroundings. So knowing, you know, maybe when is the rainy season versus the dry season, how is that going to affect the behavior of the birds? Um, so you just have to kind of use a lot of your own kind of like base knowledge when you're monitoring. Um, and to decide which sources of error are important, um, it's, it's enough for us to devise ways that we need to figure out how can we reduce sources of error. So like Lisa said, how can we make sure that we're standardizing our surveys? And again, that's why with monitoring, that's why we think about protocol. So what are some ways that we can make sure, okay, we're gonna try to consistently detect birds on the same day, or we're gonna try to consistently detect birds in the same way. And so then we design our methodology to reduce the impacts of bias and variation. And so one of what this really comes down to is standardized surveys, and which is why we will um, we'll be talking about um, next week, um, we'll be talking about what, how are we going to standardize surveys to do land bird monitoring. And so when we're standardizing a survey, this means that we're doing the survey in the exact same way every time you visit a site. And so you want to try to standardize things as much as possible. So you want to try to use the same observers and the same recorders. You want to try to use the same routes you wanna use the same survey points in the same order. You wanna make sure you're doing these surveys consistently at the same time of day and probably a time of day when you're more likely to detect birds. You wanna make sure that maybe one day you accidentally slept in and then instead of sort of doing your survey every day to 8 a.m., instead you're doing it at noon, it's really gonna change your data. So you're, you're no longer standardizing your survey as much. You wanna spend the same amount of time at each point, and you wanna spend that same amount of time every time you visit that point. So every time you visit that point, maybe you wanna spend 10 minutes trying to detect as many birds as you can, or maybe you wanna spend five minutes trying to detect every bird, or maybe even a half hour if you don't have that many points. So you really wanna make sure you're consistent though. So whatever you choose, you wanna make sure that that's what you stick with every single week, because the more you standardize um, your environment, the more you standardize how you're taking the data, then you can actually relate the changes you're seeing in the data to the data itself and not 
that, oh, okay, well, I'm seeing a difference in birds because um, I changed my survey time five times in the last month. So again, you want to make sure the more you standardize things, the more that we can actually relate changes and we can relate the populations to the data itself. And so again, you want to survey the same area every time. So you want to make sure you're consistent where you're surveying and you want to visit the same area at the same time of the year as well. So again, you want to, you want to really try to reduce as much bias as possible. Um, and so, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of observer error. That's, that's you know, we're all, we're only human, as they say. Um, but with training, we can greatly reduce observer error, error excuse me. And um, so one of the things to really focus on is identification. So really making sure you're familiar with the birds you're, you're going out to detect, knowing their calls, knowing their songs, knowing the different plumages, knowing what birds occur in the area, and just really familiarizing yourself with studying. There's like great ways to make flashcards and really just familiarize yourself with the birds you're going to detect. And then techniques on detecting birds. So um, how can you make sure that you're detecting birds? And a lot of it's like, you know, creating a search image in your mind and, you know, think looking for that bird or making sure you're listening um, and really stopping to listen to bird songs. So techniques on, on actually making sure you're detecting birds. Um, and then there's counting flocks. So how can you estimate if a huge flock of Hispaniola and parrots flies overhead, how can you make sure you get a pretty accurate um, estimation of that or and precise estimation of that flock? And then how to avoid double counting. So um, and, uh, someone made a really great comment about how sometimes we might tend to underestimate because we wanna make sure we're not counting the same birds calling and singing. So how can we make sure that we're not detecting birds twice? And I mean, of course birds move, right? So how can we make sure that we're not detecting those birds twice and reducing the disturbance? So maybe we don't wanna go out with a group of 20 people because it's gonna to be tough to detect birds when people are talking, people might be getting bored, people, you know? And so you wanna make sure, okay, how can we reduce the disturbance? Maybe we'll two of the same people will go out every week. Um, you wanna, and so we wanna just make sure we're reducing the observer error as much as possible and that the observer is getting the best count possible. So reducing the complexity, just making it as, as straightforward as possible for the observer to, to sample these birds. Um, so another thing to consider is habitat sometimes. So you wanna consider where you're actually doing this monitoring. So thick vegetation can provide a variety of trouble for us when we're out um, doing a bird count. So thick vegetation can mask vocalization. So sometimes we might not hear birds as well. Um, and it also vegetation provides plenty of hiding places. And I'm sure a lot of people have been, been in the spot where you're, you're looking at a bush and you're absolutely certain that there is a bird there, but you can't see it for the life of you, or maybe it called once and then it stopped calling. And so, you know, these the thick vegetation really, really can provide some trouble. Um, so just keeping that in mind when you're serving that, that maybe there's some birds skulking around. Um, changes in vegetation can also greatly change the available habitat and the composition of birds present. So you might, um, you might have some habitat disturbance, you might have some habitat loss, and that might actually make birds more detectable because they're no longer hiding in this dense vegetation. There's more open habitat there's more of this edge habitat so just some things to some things to consider um, as you're as you're counting birds um, and then clumps of vegetation can block observers view of portions of habitats especially sometimes in the tropics you get like clumps of mistletoe in the tree and I know euphonia love to hide behind that so just really keeping in mind um, the habitat as as you're doing these these surveys And so how can we, how can we improve our, our estimates? So how can we make sure we are getting the most true sample of the population as possible? So we can reduce or quantify the bias in the data we collect. Quantifying the bias is huge because sometimes we're not always able to reduce the bias, but if we can't reduce it, then we want to quantify it so we can at least understand where that bias is coming from. Um, we want to reduce the variation in the data we collect. So again, standardizing things as much as possible to make sure the variation we're seeing is actually a reflection of that population. Um, so increasing the detectability of the individual or species. So making sure that we're familiar with the birds we're going out to survey, 
making sure that we have the equipment we need. So we have good binoculars. Maybe we bring our Merlin app just to double check any songs, you know, so making sure that we can increase our own detectability um, of those species. And then so considering the sources of bias and variation, we want to apply that to the design of our count methodology. So we want to make sure this methodology kind of reflects um, reflects all of these things that we're kind of incorporating that all when we're considering how we want to census or survey these birds. And so how do we go about doing this? Um, so Jeff is going to be talking about this next week, and we're actually going to be discussing the ProAlis protocols that we use to survey and monitor land birds, especially tropical land birds. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Holly. I hope you guys um, were able to follow along okay. Um, we would be happy to take any questions now. Yes. Um, you could type them in the chat, or it may work also to raise your hand and we could unmute you so you can talk. Either way, let us know. to see all the people that joined us. And we did record this. So if you want to watch it again or you missed the beginning or something, we will make the link available for you to watch. So any questions? And thank you to everyone who did put comments in the chat. It's, it's really great to hear all of your experiences with land birds. And, you know, we all face the same, you know, birds. We love birds, but sometimes they're very frustrating. So thanks everyone for, for yeah, participating absolutely. in the comments. Thanks for being attentive. Um, so the next session will be a week from today, the same time. All right, so I think it's a different link to sign up, right? Holly? I think so. Yeah, yeah I think so, because this, this one was Landbird Monitoring 1. So I think the link for the next one will be Landbird Monitoring 2. Yeah, I'll see if I can find that link really quickly. And yes, we can also share the PowerPoint along with the video. Absolutely. Definitely. You can review on your own as well. Hello to Caracas, Rosa. So good to have you. All right. Any burning questions about land bird monitoring? We hope you learned something new, had some things to think about the next time you go birding. Definitely. Um, start to think about, hmm. Why is this species more detectable than that species? Or what can I do to increase the detectability of, or how, what is the best time of year to do a count if I'm interested in this species or that species, right? If you're gonna start a project, one of you guys will be talking about this in the workshop, but one of the most important things is what, are you, what is your question? You know, what is it, why do you wanna monitor birds? So first you have to form your question and then think about the objectives in monitoring to answer that question. So if you're trying to say, say there's an endangered species or threatened species and you, you don't know, have any idea what the population size is and you wanna to start to learn that, then you should start thinking about, okay, what is the best time of year to monitor this species? You might think rainy season, dry season, what do you think? Or breeding season, non-breeding season. You know, So these are some of the things you'll start to think about, like what is the optimal time of year to get a good, count a good sample of this of the species I'm interested in the weather stage of breeding you know sometimes of the year they're going to be more vocal and out in the open other times they're going to be nesting more quiet things like that question from Samai she wants to start monitoring birds in Santa Domingo oh yeah very good how to start yes mm, that's a great question um, so, well so would it, oh go ahead no, go ahead. I was just going to say, would it be easier to respond in Spanish or since her question was in Spanish or? Probably. And then maybe okay. you can repeat it in English too. Yeah. So, um, para empezar un monitoreo de aves en Santo Domingo, um, yo creo que para empezar lo que quieres es una pregunta que, que quieres saber de las aves de Santo Domingo, quieres saber la cantidad, quieres saber cuáles especies hay, la diversidad, la abundancia, que quieres saber. Entonces esa es la primera, es una pregunta. Y el eh, segundo es para organizar algo como con una universidad, con los estudiantes. Y hay, hay algunas eh, universidades muy buenas en Santo Domingo um, 
que, que puede organizar algo con ellos y después esto es para estandarizar el método. Entonces tiene la pregunta, tiene las personas que van a ayudar y después necesita eh, la, metro, la metodología para hacerlo y creo que esto es, es para empezar y ya después sigue al Santo Domingo o sigue a como reconoce una zona donde quiere monitorear las aves, um, cosas así. Y ya después, cuando tiene los datos de las aves, puede empezar a ver qué tiene, si, um, qué son los... Uh, a nuevo, creo que todo empieza con las preguntas que quieres saber. So, um, to repeat that in English, um, to start a monitoring program, what you really want is first is a question. So what are you trying to answer? What do you want to know about the birds in your area? So once you start with a question, then you can kind of start to organize something. So maybe find a group. Um, a lot of times universities are a great place with students, with researchers that might be actively um, answering a question or might be actively doing a census. And then once you kind of have your question, once you kind of have a group, then You want to also think about how do you standardize the surveys to answer the question that you want to answer. So how, what, how can we standardize things as much as possible? And then you go out and you collect your data. So then you figure out where you're going to collect your data, what data you want to collect with monitoring. Um, and, and, then, um, and then from there, you can analyze your data and kind of evaluate what to do next. So I think especially for to start in Santo Domingo, Um, I think it's good to think about questions and reach out to universities is a really good starting place. Yeah, that's great, Holly. And I would add, yeah, it all depends on your question. Maybe you have a local park and you want to know, well, what are the birds in my park? So that would just start mm -hmm. out with some very basic monitoring. Go out and do some birding and just start entering your data in eBird, eBird Caribbean. If you don't know what that is, we'll be talking about that during the workshop as well. But just yeah. get to know, first of all, what species are there? You know, if you don't know bird identification yet, then you want to get a good field guide, have your binoculars and start to learn the birds. Um, if you know birds already, you can start to monitor them. You can start going out and doing counts every week, every month. Um, but you might want to know what is the diversity over the entire year? What is it for a given season? You know, there's so many different and interesting questions that could be asked. But some of the most basic ones are just what is what birds occur here, right? That would be one of your most basic mm -hmm. questions. And how do they change over time? What's your migrants? What's your residents? How rare are they? How common are they? Those are some really, really basic questions. Yeah, knowing the changes in urban cities. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Like how do populations fluctuate in urban environments? And I think more and more we want to put mm -hmm. emphasis on understanding and restoring and providing as much habitat as possible in urban areas, right? The birds can use little pockets of habitat that we provide. And so um, some good examples, sorry for the uh, sound effects. Um, another good example is um, getting training your community, um, getting people, a group of bird watchers interested in birding and then helping you to monitor. And I don't know if we have anybody from Antigua on the call tonight, but um, The Environmental Awareness Group in Antigua and Barbuda has done a really nice job with that. At the start of the pandemic, they did a basic bird ID and monitoring course virtually. And they had about 30 participants that went through like a six session course. The group started going out birding by themselves and together. And now this group is monitoring different habitats all the time. They participated in the Caribbean Waterbird Census. They um, have a WhatsApp group, so they're always sharing, you know, photos of what they've seen. You know, some of them are still learning bird ID, so they'll post pictures. They'll post pictures of things they've seen that they don't know yet. Anyway, that's a great play way to get started in, in urban areas is, um, you know, learn your birds. If you don't know your birds well, see if you can find someone that can help you out, you know, go birding with you, teach you bird yeah. ID, because, of course, bird ID is one of the most basic things. And um, try to get pictures if you don't know something, if you've seen something, you're not sure where it is, try to record a song, try to take pictures of it. Um, you'll learn about the Merlin Bird ID app from Jeff, which is really, really helpful um, for identifying some species because you can record the song in Merlin. It's like um, Shazam for birds, um, which is really amazing if you guys use Shazam. So there's lots of great tools out there for, for learning bird ID. 
So it's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, you can come in at any level, you know, as a beginner or somebody that, that's more advanced already knows your birds and you already have questions, you're going to be able to dive right into um, starting with a protocol. Any other questions? There's a question on, uh, is the, Daniela asks if the Proalis protocol is species specific or is it general? Can it be adapted? And um, this might be a question for the next meeting. We'll definitely dive into that more in depth in the next meeting, but um, briefly, it, it's designed for land birds throughout uh, Latin America. It was, it was the, the original design of this. It's, uh, it's kind of in the middle between, uh, or uh, as to how complex it is for the observer. Um, we tried to, to design the protocol so it can be utilized with a lot of different statistical and modeling techniques. Um, but as far as the species goes, it's really designed for land birds um, and mostly forest land birds, though it certainly works in, in more open habitats as well. But it's not a seabird protocol or a nesting, you know, a nesting protocol or a water bird, water bird census protocol or things like that. So it really is designed for land birds. Mm -hmm. Yep, so tune in next week, a week from tonight, and Jeff will be diving into the ProWallis protocol. Oh yeah, Rose is saying groups is very funny counting birds. It's not easy. Flocks of fast warblers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mixed Those species warblers, flocks. Good Those can be really challenging. Yep, but you'll learn, you'll be practicing, you'll be learning some techniques for for counting the birds when it's when it's complicated. Oh, thank you, Adrian. Yes, she put in the details for next week, and there's the link to register if you haven't registered yet. Be sure to join us next week, and we will send a link to this recording so that you can review it again. And um, also, we will send you the PowerPoint so you can have that as a reference. And of course, you're free to use it because this is what we consider um, train the trainer as well. So we want you to go out and use what you've learned from these sessions and from our workshop in the DR to um, train others in your community to get them into birding and to bird monitoring. Um, we need lots of more birders and citizen scientists out there. And um, as you'll learn, or as you may know already, citizen science and eBird monitoring is an incredible tool and we need to get more and more people using it in the Caribbean. It's already getting quite popular, but um, we need more people. Yes. Um, are you going to be doing a census? Yeah, there's going to be lots of practice um, monitoring sessions in the DR, lots of time in the field. First of all, practicing bird ID, getting familiar with all the birds in the DR, and then yes, practicing the protocol. There will be demonstrations. You guys will do some practice transects and counts and mm -hmm. you'll be sharing your results and discussing, well, so-and-so saw 10 birds, I only saw seven, why is that? You know, like what are the sources of bias or variation in our counts, right? Uh, maybe somebody has really good hearing and maybe you're hearing, you're not picking up little chip calls or something from some bird and somebody else really knows that bird well. So that's gonna be a source of variation in the counts. So you'll be discussing all these different kinds of counts. But how do you account for observer error and eBird data? Oh, that's Ooh, a good question. <laughs> that's a good question for Jeff. Um, it's a challenge. Um, the the generally it's repeat if we have repeated counts by different observers at the same location over time, then you can begin to to pull apart the differences in. As Lisa said, some people will will hear birds better than than others. Others will see birds and find them better. My my hearing right now is is better than than my sight, unfortunately, for some reason. Um, so it's just a in those repeated counts that you can compare across observers start to get at those differences and those those individual biases at, at uh, mm -hmm. with with counts of birds. Yeah. So they actually do that at the lab, right? At Cornell, they're analyzing mm -hmm. the data and, and kind yeah. of coming up with differences between individuals even in detectability and, and incorporating that into the model. Right, and it changes from region to region too. Somebody yeah. who's very familiar with birds in one region 
you know, or right. may not be we're in a different region. Right. Yeah. Very good. Good questions, you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we wish we could see all of you in the DR next week. Um, we wish we could yeah. accept it, everybody, but we're glad that we'll have you for a couple of sessions and we will definitely try to repeat this workshop too and have more people in person. Yep. Yeah, the other thing is um, in Puerto Rico this summer, I hope you guys know about the conference that we're holding. Um, Birds Caribbean is co-hosting our international conference this year with the American Ornithological Society. And so that's gonna be from June 27th to July 1st. And on the day after the um, main conference, we will be having a day where we're gonna be training in the Proalis manual. So if you weren't able to come to the workshop in the DR, we will be doing some practice in the field and doing like a one day mini training on the Proalis protocol. So that's another place if you're gonna to come to the conference to stay an extra day and participate in that training. Adrian, can you find the link um, quickly to more information about the AOS? I can probably find it too, let's see. Yeah, just make sure you follow us on our website. We have a link from the homepage to information about the conference and we will keep updating that. The main conference website will be on the AOS website, but we will keep our own site updated with like, here's the latest thing that's happening. You know, like now's the time to um, submit an abstract or, you know, the speakers have just been announced or the workshops have just been announced. So we'll, we'll keep you guys informed on our website with links to their website, but you can also go directly to the AOS's website and follow up there. So we hope as many of you as possible will come to that conference. It's going to be fantastic. Um, I think that abstract submissions are due March 1st. So think about submitting a paper. If you're doing any kind of research or conservation project, you could submit a paper and come give a talk. Um, the Caribbean will be hosting a few symposia and workshops, so that's going to be really exciting. We'll be letting you know about those soon. So definitely start thinking about attending the conference. You should definitely come if you've never been to one of our conferences. They're, they're really great. And of course, since we're having it with AOS, there will be lots of opportunity for meeting other ornithologists from other regions and sharing information and techniques and um, networking and collaborating. So it'll really be a great opportunity. Okay, so registration, Samantha's asking, how much does the conference cost? Um, registration is gonna open up in the next week or two. So keep an eye out for that. If you are follow us on social media, we will post about that and also on our website. Um, we don't know yet what the cost will be for sure, but you have to think about your flight, you have to think about your accommodations and you have to think about the registration. And there's gonna be um, different registration rates depending on your status. If you're a student, it'll be lower. If you're an early career ornithologist or wildlife manager, it'll be lower. If you're a Caribbean national, it's gonna be lower. Um, so they're gonna have kind of tiered registration, but usually it's somewhere between $250, $300 for the week. 300, two, between 250 and 350 is just a guesstimate right now for registration rates. And um, so you'll have to think about your flight. Um, there's deals at three different hotels that are near the convention center in San Juan. And if you share a room, you know, with two or three or even four people, you know, the more people you share with, the cost of the room will go down. So if you're on a budget, think about sharing with two or three other people. And it, the cost might be, um, I don't know, $70, $80 a night for a room, something like that, you know, for a shared room, maybe even less. So as, when the registration rates, when registration opens, they'll have information on the cost of the hotel, things like that. And you can start to look up the cost of flights from wherever you're coming from to get an idea of that, but hopefully you can watch for some fair sales and, and maybe get a good deal on a flight. All right, well, if there's no other questions, we will see all of you hopefully next week. And um, in the next day or two, we'll get you the link to this webinar and also send you the presentation. So thanks again to everybody for joining, for your comments, your questions, really good to have all of you. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Yep. Great. Good Thanks, everybody. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.